I'm going to be reading through my notes and just going backwards and forwards, but I've um, got my time wrong. Anyway, we are not. Uh, in Māori epistemology, all knowledge emanates from the celestial realm of the gods, Walker 2004. With this in mind, the philo philosophical principles of Rāranga Fatu are a culmination of many facets of inquiry and discovery. The term kimihia, a Māori term is to seek, which provides an eminent pathway to further inquiry through one's own desire to engage. The intergenerational um, knowledge transfer is about the pūrāko behind uh, each of the kākahu in the time periods, beginning with my great-grandmother, Mere Tūrungu Pāmama. Um, at her time, uh, she, she went through uh, um, her time in life, you know, how do you, when you think about it, how do you <laughs> try and put a, a person's life in uh, in an extraordinary life at that, and each and every one I, I think is an extraordinary from my great grandmother down to ourselves. But Mary Te Rongo Paumama, she um, went through alienation, land confiscation, assimilation, and subordination at the time of transitional changes that took place, and how she, she would have experienced all these changes. As a teenager, she was one of the children um, who escaped Rangiafio Church in 1914 when all Māori uh, men, women and children were locked into church and burnt. Um, so I'm leading up to Manamoto Haki in, in the story. And she helped her mother, uh, she helped a mother and child escape the onslaught of soldiers, the Red Coats Junior Orako Battle immediately after the Rangiafio Church Massacre. So she, was, she knew what was coming. She also attended Parihaka to support the passive resistance. Those are some of the, these are some of the stories, you know, I've just given you a brief, <laughs> um, that, that we are taught, that we are told, and that we hold on to, which helps with our motuhake, mana motuhake. And then, of course, is my, um, and, and this cloak represents Mere Te time. I look at this and I see the stories. So I tell the story through the weaving, through the kaka. And then, of course, my grandmother who died at the right age of 103. And um, the one thing, she, she was a... Um, math, 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 mathematically a, a technician of maths. But she couldn't figure out Lotto. <laughs> <laughs> However, her father was uh, kept captive by the Manyaputu chiefs. And, realize, and they realised his skills could, they could capitalise on his skills, her father being uh, Charles Hursthouse. And he was actually a surveyor. So with this in mind, my grandmother, Meritaroa Papama and Charles Hursthouse, begat Rangi Māori, and that's the reason for her name, because of the rift between the, the, the two, the chiefs of Manyaputo and this, the, her father. So she was brought up by her mother mainly, and by the time her, fa her father came to get her at the age of 12, there was no way that she was going to leave uh, the bosoms of her mother. But because she only knew how to speak the real, she only knew one way, and that was her Māori ma ma ways. And she was widowed at the age of um, 49, um, due to her husband after returning from World War I. But beside that, she's, she's well known for her, um, retaining the um, arts of raranga, especially in Fatu Kākahu. But it's the stories behind all of those that makes the resi It's about resistance and resilience. 
So this is just one of her many kātāis, you know, I'm thinking, which one shall I choose? I'm thinking, well, it actually doesn't matter. Then, of course, it comes down to my mum, the Gareth Rangi Tuatahi Te Kamawa, born in 1920. As a child, she was sickly. And, of course, going through um, a, a sickly state, she loved reading, though. She, she enjoyed embracing education. And, and it was prominent that the, the social change was happening. She was also the puhi of Miringa Tikakara, which is a wānanga uh, down in Reriahu. And when she told her, his, her stories to us, she, she talked about how she had, it was an epiphany when she walked in the, in, into the, the puhi being the, the, um, uh, a, a young child, a virgin child, and she walked into Miringa Tikakara. She said it was just a whole awe happened to her. And she knew from then that it was something that she had to do in her life that would be a, a gift of consequences to her people and to her children, namely us. And then, it, of course, it comes down, the, uh, comes down to this is the kaka who she made for my dad for the long love she had for him. That kākahu, I remember um, helping with the making of that. The feathers came in, the feather mattress, we don't know from where, <laughs> and turned it into this kākahu. So the continuum of intergenerational knowledge transfer, or the legacy, carries on through my older sisters, uh, Ria Rani Maria Davis, my uh, Rani Tuatahi, to kind of myself, my nieces, uh, Veranor Hetit Hauahi, Hauaho, Cloudy Ngātai, so, and my grandnieces, so six generations from my great grandmother. And this is the theory and research methodology I have adopted uh, to using the Tanical pattern. And it's about the rise of the feminine, uh, there, and the descent of the Patakura, so it's the Māre Kura and the Patakura. These here represent the uh, the poor, the black, coming into to the brown, which is the uh, Tānekaha, the yellow, the Rauruko, and there in the centre is the Patumanoa, the spiritual eye of which we see things. And I've based my methodology on the technique of Tāniko, how the threads behind support and illuminate the one in front, and that's why the change of colours. Right, moving on quickly. Um, how is intergenerational transfer of weaving traditional practice possible for the survival of weaving? Okay, so besides the, the stories I've just told quickly, um, I'm working on a piece down, uh, so that's the uri, um, and these, these are all of the pieces that we've, we've done, but the one, the pukoro. This has never actually been done before, and I've uh, started to research it when I was at Otago Museum. Hamilton, Augustus Hamilton, <coughs> deposited a cache of artifacts to the Otago Museum and called the pukoro, this piece here, a rag. So the exhibition that I intend is going to be about the higher consciousness of thought and skills of the unknown weaver. I can tell the story about our, our family, like what you've just witnessed, very quickly. And, and I decided to call it uh, from the rag to richness. It's the richness, the consciousness of the weaver. Our focus is toward illuminating details of realism and what are seemingly trivial aspects within our kaupapa or as experienced weavers may be taken for granted in our lives. It is only with further questioning and transformation of thinking that one has a deeper desire or passion to rediscover new scenarios, knowledge and functionality and that one can be in a state of contextualising meaning to purpose. Hence the reason 
where I want to bring to life the consciousness, try to, of the weaver, because this piece cannot even be seen, so I'm going to replicate it to tell the story, and I want to put a log to, together. So we work with an, an uh, epistemological hologram based on, this is what, how I feel, on the values of rationalities. And these can be categorised as the, the hiningaro, the technical rationality, which is the microcosm of designing our system of knowledge. And that defines our understanding so that it becomes our measure, our mana mutnahaka. Tēnā hermeneutic rationality is a subject to different interpretations. So, as I'm weaving, what I mean is I can actually change what I'm doing. I might have something in my mind, but I can change it. So it's subject to different changes in very perspectives of evolving and engaging knowledge. And thus, it evaluates our own thought patterns and ways. Then there's the wairua the emancipatory rationality, defining one's own freedom of discovery through embracing knowledge that has a functional purpose. This is an area we can witness our purpose of what we have engaged in to reach our goals. So if we seek the essence of our oral and visual language, we become more familiar with the notion of realistic thinking in practical purpose terms. By this I mean Fakatoki, Fakairo, Raranga Fatu, and Kofai Fai have messages that will see a person's way forward to our truth of existence. Here's the essence, here's the essence of mana motuhake through the art of oral and visual engagement. The truth of existence is encapsulated through visual narratives and words that add potentiality and value to the knowing. I have a list of words that I'll quickly go through. Whakapapa usually refers to our genealogy um, and there are various uh, perspectives of whakapapa. And for me, in this case, the whakapapa determines the way in which we knowledge, in which our knowledge of subject matters becomes the kaupapa, the foundation of objectivity that is derived from the linear for sequential notions of realities. And the mana is often referred to prestige respect and honour of a person. Mana in this context is a revered aspect of knowledge skills that is integral to topic, which defines truth and relevance to context, giving substance and meaning to our own interpretations of symbolism <coughs> and visual language. And the manakitanga, to give and show support still within to keeping of, of <coughs> the meaning of this word, we engage in manakitanga by reflecting on our own understanding and taking time to listen, to interpret and share thoughts and to get engage by showing interest and sharing discussion on subject matter. In the whakapuna, similar to manakitanga, how in this case to be truthful with the engagement of discussion. Tapu to respect and honour each other's skills, knowledge and thoughts, however, not in a way to restrict ourselves from being objective and using common sense. In the Modi, the life essence or force, metaphorically in an art of context, is a combination of whanuitanga, an expression of a knowledge outward, kohunatanga, the depth of knowledge, and maramatanga, the enlightening of that knowledge. And of course, above all else, aroha, the love, the care, the sincerity, and the honourable relationships you have with materials and people that surround you and your mentors. So when you put, combine mana motu hake together, what I'm referring to here is engagement of a distinctive <coughs> echelon of knowledge through only a loving practice. I'll just go through these, and, and what I did was had to scientifically look at the materials and see if I was right about my notions, and yep, I was. But I had to convince the um, doctors and scientists in the material culture papers that it was not harakeke, like they thought it was kiakia. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Wow, beautiful. 
I just, when I looked at it, I said, it's Kia Kia, and they said, how do you know that? And I said, oh, because I'm a weaver. <laughs> I thought that was weird, but then I realised, hang on a minute, back up. So um, I'm doing samples at the moment. Just to give you some idea, the, these are, are strands are less than one mil. Wow. Yeah. It's about two and a half, two and a half thousand strands. I think to myself, why did I decide to do this? But anyway, so you know, we have our our fakatokis, but I like the what Aristotle, the aim of the artist, not to represent the outward appearance of things, but the inward significance. Of, this is exactly what I want to do for. So the, here's a, um, I'm, I'm throwing up a few um, ideas, you know. Where does the heart feel nourished? Ah. <laughs> so I'll quickly cancel that out. <laughs> Wherever the heart feels nourished, go there. And that's why I've gone there. It's out of my rohe, but it's, this is about our knowledge. That weaver, to honour her, to bring back that richness to those people. <coughs> and it's also about tāko hangia, the gift of giving. We can never stop giving. Mātou behind the practice of it first. You can read it for yourself. This is what I'm trying to say. So I'll quickly go through these books. Back. And there's some of the people, you know, it resonates, a lot of these resonate with what I'm doing. And I end with one of my mentors. Kilda. Kilda. Kilda.